Everybody, welcome to the party. I hope everybody is super excited. Today is what? Well, it's, I, I was almost. Oh, what is going on? Hold on one second. I can hear audio in my ear. Hold on one second. One second. Woo! I had the stream running on a separate tab, and I started getting the intro it blowing out my ear over here. Jesus! Welcome everybody to Simply Cyber Live, the Thursday live stream long form interview podcast where we bring on. Uh, practitioners from across the cybersecurity industry to deliver their knowledge, share their experiences, and overall have a wicked good time all up in here. And today, I am super pumped to be bringing you, you know, arguably the most offensive person, quote unquote, because he's a really nice guy. So he's not offensive in that way, but he's the APT chameleon. Again, I'm the only one saying that, so don't Google it. Uh, but our guest today is Mike Saunders, and Mike is the principal consultant at Red Siege Information Security. He's got over 25 years of experience in IT and security, and he's worked across many different sectors like banking and insurance, agro. And throughout his career, Mike has gained expertise in many different roles, which allows him to be the chameleon, including system and network administration, development, security architecture. And he's recognized, as far as I know, this is how I know him, for his extensive knowledge and his contribu uh, contributions to the field of cybersecurity, especially in offensive security operations, particularly red team engagements. Mike is a wealth of knowledge. Standard practices here. If you're a hashtag first timer, welcome to the party, pal. We are going to be going back and forth. I'm going to kick things off with Mike, but the real show is about you asking your questions, getting the answers and the knowledge that you seek. And Mike, delivering on all that and having a great experience. I hope you're as pumped up as I am. Let's go get Mike and have a wicked good time, y'all. Hey, Mike, what's cracking? How's it going, buddy? It's, it's all right. It's all right. They're, like, it was messed up because as soon as I said go live, like, this, this platform was like, hey, let me give you a tool tip, which it's never done in two years. Let me give you a tool tip. And then I'm like, no, no tool tip. And then it was like, the other tab was blowing out music in my ear. But anyways, Mike, welcome to the show. We're super pumped to have you. Thank yeah, you. For thanks for here. having me. I got to tell you, like just the intro alone makes it worth it. Because today was having kind of a self-doubt kind of day, like we were talking about beforehand. Like code that's worked for months and I didn't look at it. And then I went to go use it today. Like it didn't work. And like, how do I computer? I've been doing this a long time and I'm feeling like a complete inept person this morning and uh into the afternoon and then you come in i was like yeah you know i i've been around a minute like i've done i've been here a while thanks man so that's good like you, you can't come into this and not be pumped after an intro like that oh my god it's awesome yeah no i love it and and dude well well deserved well um well earned all those accolades i mean you've given presentations at conferences you've done demonstrations obviously you've done amazing uh like you know contracting work for individuals um you know so before we dive right into the mix let, let me ask you like how was your new year's eve mike let, let's let's talk a little like about mike how, how was your new year's eve man you know, I've had years of going out and having a good time on New Year's Eve. And then I played in a band for about 10 years. And uh, I realized that New Year's is amateur hour, man. Oh, like, so that, like all the people who don't drink and don't have any practice at it, they go out <laughs> New Year's Eve and then they, they're out of practice and it's just a mess. And and so now I don't really enjoy going out New Year's Eve. So my New Year's Eve was spent, uh, you know, having a cigar in the garage, watching, probably watching some photography videos and just relaxing. How about oh, you? That, that does sound good. So I've got young children and uh, we actually have a little bit of a, um, a annual tradition that it's turned into that I, I freaking love. So, you know, we try to eat healthy. We still like, you know, gorge junk food occasionally, but we try to eat healthy. But on New Year's Eve, uh, about two o'clock, we head out to like, you know, Target or Walmart or grocery store, or wherever. And there's no rules, like whatever you the kids, the kids are eight and 11, like whatever heat and serve, you know, like, you know, mozzarella sticks, potato skins, like what, whatever you want. Uh, throw it in the basket and let's go. And then about seven, six to 30 at night, we, we heat everything up and just put a big smorgasbord out. We get the Wii going and it just turns into 
uh, a wee party basically uh, with uh, with apps. It's 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 a lot of fun. Heavy hors d'oeuvres, if you will. Nice. Yeah. First year in a while we made it to midnight, I might add. I haven't seen north of 1030 for I can't Yeah. Think. Yeah. I made it to like twelve oh three and it was like and that was by mistake. Like I'm crawling into bed. I was like, oh guess I made it. Oh my God, that's awesome. So so let's let's turn to um your skill. Um and you know, I guess let me just start right off the rip with um I, I've been calling you these last couple of days as I've been pumping this show, the APT Chameleon. And the reason that I said that is because, you know, the difference, if if you've been around for a minute, you know, but this is kind of a question that tricks people up when they first get in the industry. There is a critical difference between penetration testing and red teaming. And essentially red teaming is where you assume the identity and the TTPs of a specific threat actor in order to execute that on a client organization to see how they'd stack up against that. You do advanced red teaming. So, I mean, it, it, can you kind of uh, pull, like tease out me saying APT Chameleon, your ability to uh, become Muddy Water or become uh, Lazarus Group or something like that? Is there is there truth in that or is that misleading? I mean, that, that there's definitely some to that. Uh, sometimes clients come to us and they want us to emulate a specific adversary. Um my recommendation in those is more like let's do that as a collaborative assessment and and we'll build techniques because the thing when you're emulating a specific adversary is that like it's already old ttps right like unless it's just dropped you know just came out they're they're out there there's already detections for them uh but we certainly incorporate those kinds of ideas that people will say oh we want to see process hollowing and we want to see unhooking and we want to see uh, whatever these you know i'm sure someone's going to be asking about the, the new code execution technique the pool party thing like people are going to want to see that and we will build proofs of concept to help go with that but along like that's just the payload side of things right there's also the, the infrastructure where are we where are we putting up our c2 server where are we putting up our phishing server getting all that stuff built out. And then the phishing campaign, what does it look like? Is it a direct send phishing campaign? Is it uh, something sent through some of the big mail platforms, you know, just kind of abusing things that exist out there? Are you standing up your own domain? And then what do those messages look like? Are they, are they targeted for industry specific or like a real specific thing? Uh, are they more generic? Like, Hey, here's your latest UPS receipt, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, so we will, sometimes clients say, just go loose, you mm -hmm. know, go hog wild. And sometimes say, we want you to do this specific type of thing. And, and we, we can definitely do that in any shade in between. So um, as far as like the Red Siege team, and by the way, Red Siege is the company Mike works at. Um, offensive, well, I guess let me just say it's a it's a consulting company that specializes in identifying and addressing real world threats to organizations. They have pen testing, red teaming, ransomware readiness, app pen testing, purple team. Just so everybody kind of understands what Red Siege is and what Mike's doing. But let let me ask you, Mike. Again, I haven't worked for an offensive security company before, so I, I don't understand. But like between the new pool party comes out and someone's got to write a payload and understand how to exploit um, it's getting the C2 infrastructure, you know, keeping it, keeping it fresh, keeping it hidden. If it gets burned down, standing up another one, actually doing client engagements, doing the business development meetings and all that. Do you, are, do you guys segment yourself? So it's like, you know, these people are payload people or, you know, exploit devs and these people are consultants in front of the client or like, how do you do it? Uh, we do not do that. Um, because we're, you know, a fairly small consultancy, mm -hmm. um, when you get to a certain size, there there does become some economies available to really dedicate a full-time dev person, you mm -hmm. know. And mm -hmm. if you look at some of the bigger behemoths like Trusted Sec, right, like they, uh, they started out small, they're huge now. You know, they've got dedicated research and development teams. We're pretty small. Uh, so we don't have that dedicated research and development role. But what we do have, uh, if you're in the consulting world, you'll find that Q1 gets to be pretty slow. 
Uh, so there's a lot of dev time that happens in Q1, uh, a lot of project improvements. And then we have a few people on our team that are more familiar. About half the team has a lot of experience writing some amount of code and can adapt new techniques that uh, we're learning. So we have a toolkit of, of techniques that are based on uh, public examples that we've tweaked a little bit, things that we've come up from our own, mm -hmm. uh, our own techniques, and then a blends of those and tried to set up, you know, if Jason on our team, uh, Jason's great at social engineering and the network pen test side, hasn't done a lot of assume breach, hasn't done a lot of like building payloads, but we've got a toolkit set up that all he knows how to go to Cobalt Strike or Brute Retail or whatever, generate the shell code run this run this tool that one of us has written that spits out a payload that he can now go run without having to know how to work it from the ground up and then if something doesn't work we hop in so we don't have dedicated roles for that but uh what we do have is uh scripts that help us do the automation for building things and building things repeatedly or repeatably uh, we have documentation, which is huge. Like if you're if you're in any job and you don't have documentation, uh, you're failing. Uh, but <laughs> um, like for us, hey uh, Leonardo, thanks for wearing the red sheet red seed shirt right now. It's awesome. All all the other uh, great comments out there. But oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, we you've got to have that documentation so that you can hand it to someone new and. Uh, they can they can hit the ground running or you know as you probably know in the uh consulting world there's a lot of subcontracting you mm -hmm. know oh we don't have availability for that but someone really wants to go through us because they've got paperwork with us already hey can we sub this out and they say yes yeah. so we bring in someone else to sub that out well they need to be able to work the way we work um and so we've got things like documentation that we can give them that this is exactly how Red Siege does reporting. This is how Red Siege stands up C2. And if I go do a uh, if I go do a subcontract for another consultancy, they've got that same kind of documentation. And then we have it there. So we don't have the specialization right now. Um, maybe that'll be a thing when we get big enough. You know, when we add some more people, that it might make sense to do that right now where we're at like that's not a pain point for us well okay so as a practitioner who's working in a smaller org and I, I almost feel like there's more smaller offensive security boutique firms than there are large ones um you know just anecdotally um so do you feel um it's challenging to do that context shifting between you know client work and then research and dev and then you know, you know, grunt work of like C2 frameworks and rebuilding. Like, how's that? How is that? It can be. Uh, it can definitely be a challenge, uh, especially when you're when you're less experienced with doing it. That uh, going from client facing engagement and doing that kind of thing and then hopping down in the weeds and debugging like a shell code loader. And then someone's like, hey, I'm having a problem with my C2. Can you help me? And be like, okay, what's going on with CloudFront? How do I troubleshoot this? Like, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a challenge. But the reality is like what we're doing, we're constantly context switching anyways, because mm -hmm. we're doing something and then we see something completely different. Be like, oh, what is this service that I just discovered on this system? And now I got to go read about it. So I went from, oh, doing some file sharing enumeration, finding some creds, being able to log into a system with those creds. And now like, oh, what's on there? Oh, these apps are there. And now I'm in a completely different context. Instead of enumerating shares, I'm learning about how this software works and can I abuse it for my purposes? So it, it's always context sh shifting. And some people do struggle with that. Uh, and it's a, it's a skill that you got to develop. Yeah. I think a lot of people who are in chat right now that are do wearing many hats at work, uh, are, are, um, feeling heard or feeling seen Mike, uh, by, by what you're saying here. <laughs> Kayla Sturgeon wants to throw out a question. She said, do you find that emulating a specific APT can be difficult to the specific client and their existing network as well? 
So there, it can be difficult in a couple of ways. One, do we have all the information available uh, to do that? Or sometimes we know like what, what happened on the target machine, but we don't know what generated it. So now you're trying to, how do I reverse engineer the impact to build a payload to recreate that? So, you know, there's there are some pieces there that can be tough. If you don't have the tooling, you've got to write it and be like, what exactly did it do? So you may not have all the information, depending on how long it's been since the uh since that threat group has acted or that particular campaign has been observed there's now been various layers of network defense and endpoint defense that maybe have implemented controls and based on that particular campaign mm -hmm. and so it worked for that threat actor but it won't work in this client environment because let's say they've put in some type of network inspection layer. Um, I can't get my thing to the endpoint because it's now blocked here, uh, the network out in front of the endpoint where that never happened for the APT group because that network device didn't exist, right? So mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, well, you caught it. And they're like, well, we want to see the impact on the endpoint. It's like, yeah, but you're blocking it here or you don't have X which that apt group was abusing like you yeah. don't have configuration x so we can't do that thing and that becomes a, a challenge uh, for sure um which is why as kind of said earlier is that we try to do try to blend that mm -hmm. try to try to do a blended approach like take what the apt group is doing but then keep that up to date I love it. And I really quick want to say shout out. I see Molly Murdoch in chat, Red Siege is own. What's up, Molly? Good to see you. And Kathy Chambers is in the house. A lot of people turning out, Mike. A lot of, a lot of friends and familiar faces. Yeah. So shout Molly out makes us run. I just want to give Molly a shout out. Like <laughs> she keeps us in line and gets us uh uh gets us where we need to be. So I love it. I love it. We'll give Molly the uh, Ric Flair woo. <laughs> So Shadow Crab wants to know uh, when you're working in an environment because you said it earlier, like go buck wild, like no rules, just go crazy with no scoop, with no scope. Excuse me, that's fun, obviously, because you can just pull out all your like random toys. But can it be overwhelming? Yeah, a hundred percent. Like I saw that question earlier. I hate no scope, and then just like go wild because, like one, it can be fun, but most clients actually have things that they want but they may not be good in articulating those mm -hmm. uh, or there's assumptions that were made um you know someone talked to molly and joe originally and then i get on later to do the test but there's a bit of knowledge that didn't get transferred for some reason and so mm -hmm client wanted this and either they didn't say it they didn't say it clearly you know who knows what happens but we don't have that information then you're going wild and they're like whoa 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 what are you doing what what's happening here um it's also like i don't want to do what's just fun for me mm -hmm. um that would be great if i could do that but my the entire point of me what is the point of you, Craig? Um, the entire point of Mike is to make sure that the client is better off at the end of the day. And what I think is best may not be best for them. I don't know their business. You know, I don't know their specifics. So that's why we try to have those those calls ahead of time, find out like what's the thing that keeps you up at night? Like mm -hmm if it was taken out or the data was stolen like what's the thing that keeps you up and then let's design the testing around making sure that we exercise that um just going wild and me doing what i think is fun is not necessarily valuable to the client and 
my only purpose is to make the client better at the end of the engagement. And just because I'm having fun doesn't mean that they're benefiting. So I that, mean, that's you, part of the frustration. Will you almost push back on a client if they say buck wild? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I would be like, you need to tell me what's acceptable and what are, give me a top three things of things you'd like to see then. Like, okay, I will do anything, but what are the top three things that you would like to see? So I can make sure at least that we're hitting some of the things. Because they can be wildly different between what their expectation is and what my assumption of what they need is. Mm -hmm. And if that mismatch, everyone walks away unhappy. Yeah. You know, it almost makes me think of like when you're, you're trying to get like, you know, like art done or something like I, I was, I'm recently, I'm in the middle of doing like a brand refresh for Simply Cyber and you know, like, or you're getting a website made and the person's like, well, what do you want? You're like, I don't know, make it look cool. It's like, well, <laughs> what define cool, my friend. Um, so a, a lot of questions are coming in. We got a couple here for you, Mike, that are interesting, less about offensive, but more about kind of the meta of your work. So I want to ask you these two questions here back to back. Uh, CJ wants to know, do you feel you spend more time with documentation and client engagement than uh, coding or, or coding and offensive work? Are you doing more tech stuff? Or are you doing more like, you know, I guess paper stuff? I mean, like it varies. It, some, some weeks you have a little more wiggle room than others. And mm -hmm. you can get more done. But we also set out dedicated, excuse me, dedicated times for like process improvement. If if we're going through and we see that there are multiple testers having the same problem with the same thing, be like, Molly, can I get a week or can I get two days or whatever coming up here soon so that I can uh so that I can retool this process or I can rewrite this tool so that it works and you know that no one's having a problem with it. So then we'll block out time for that. Sometimes we're just having a, we're just gonna have to go with it and try to make it work as we go along. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I would say like the majority of my time if I'm on an assessment is spent doing assessment related, but some some are more than others and sometimes you know as part of let's say a red team or an assume breach i need to get a new payload uh shell code loader working and it's not working against edr x well i'm writing code on the fly to get that but that isn't disposed of unless there is some specific thing in the client that says like hey we own everything you write and you don't get to keep that that shell code loader is now getting documented and getting in a point that is reusable for other people. And that, that doesn't take that long, um, or at least goes in the backlog of things mm -hmm. to get done. So it, it, someone I've seen, it depends pop up a lot, <laughs> but I, I hope that answered that question. Yeah, of course it did. It did. Uh, and shout out. I see Jack Scott in the house. Uh, big fan of Jack's good to see you at the live, uh, Chris rock. I don't know if you know, Chris rock. Um, uh, Mike, but he's a Aussie off offensive security guy. Uh, love Chris Rock and his talks. He wants to know, you, you know, Red Siege is uh, a smaller firm, as you pointed out. How much of your time is doing sales, pre-sales, business development stuff compared to actual engagements? And do you like to blend it or do you prefer one over the other? So when we were really small, when it was like me and Tim or me and Tim and Corey, and then me and you know, add Jason, when there was just a couple of us, uh, it was it was quite a bit more. Um, I was doing a lot of sales calls. Um, but now, uh, you know, we've got Joe as, as our senior sales guy, and he's, he's killing it. You know, he understands what we're doing and uh, gets it. And so he handles the majority of it. And then he can just kind of kick it over to someone be like, Hey, can someone give me some eyes on this to make sure I'm quoting this right? Like, and here's a summary of the engagement. So I spend very little time in the sales side of thing in the business development um, is definitely, there's some time invested there, like right now, you know, being here, like I'm on your streams, helping your people, but this would be something we would consider uh, business development, right? Yeah, because it's, it's the getting, brand. 
yeah, it's a brand getting the name out there, going, speaking at a con, working the time to put the talk together, writing blog posts. Um, we try to do those in our free time. Uh, usually when we have some downtime, but sometimes if there's a bigger project, like again, we just say, Hey, Molly, we want some uh, time to do this. Can you block off time to do, to work on this tool, to build the CTF, whatever it is so that we can release that. And that's part of that biz dev thing. Oh, this is good. I'm learning more and more about Red Siege as we talk. I should have contacted Molly to get this aligned. I, she's probably like, Ooh, like wagging her finger because I do, I went directly to you, Mike, to get your time. Sorry, Molly. Uh, and if you see uh, Red Siege at Wild West Hackenfest, they have a presence. They roll deep there, and uh, it's all about it's all about uh, good times. Uh, let me let me quickly point out here. We saw a super chat come in. Uh, Nerman Zletnovich, who's a regular. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Nerman's got a question. We're throwing it up there. Uh, five, five tools for pen testing, in your opinion, what are the top five tools or what are, what are five, like go to it's in Mike's toolbox tools for, you know, offensive security. Well, yeah. So that's a good question. Like what kind of testing, right? Like, so I'm, <laughs> I'm going to make it all it of depends. the testing. Yeah. <laughs> um, first thing, uh, burp, burp pro okay. buy a burp sweet pro license. It's $300. And it is the best $300 that you will spend because it is the tool for doing web app pen testing. So you got to have Burp Pro. Um, I would say uh, you need, let's see, what, what else do you need besides that? Um, you're going to use... Do you need a C2 framework? Well, if you're doing like assume breach and red team, you do need some type of C2. And there are a lot of great C2s out there. Uh, I mainly use uh, I mainly use Cobalt Strike, okay. uh, but we do use Brute Retail. Um, and then depending on the engagement, we might use Sliver. Uh, we might use Merlin. Um, we've looked at Havoc a little bit. And there are others out there. Some shops are writing their own completely from the ground up C2. Some are repurposing other open source. Uh, so you need some kind of C2. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got Zap. You need some kind of C2. You need a good reporting tool. Like I think Ooh. you need Microsoft Word. Um, like <laughs> I, there are lots of tools out there for generating pen test reports and I haven't found one that works. Like learn how to use word learn how to write a style template that's reusable like learn how to use word styles and like it'll make your life so much easier um and your reports look so much better than when they come out of uh like some pre-canned yeah. package um snag it pro if you're a person that's doing like screenshots like mm -hmm. it can get down to almost the pixel level type of uh uh screenshot and man, it makes like my this? life so much easier. This guy right here, get the old, get the old arrows with the call out. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, <laughs> Snagit is the best if you're a person that has to do reports and give evidence. Like before, I got Snagit, I spent so much time. Uh, do you with do you, is one of your go to tools? It, it's funny. I, I by the way, I love that the question was pen testing tools, and everybody, including myself's mind, went to like hacker tools and like what's it going to be? And look, Microsoft Word, Snagit, like two of the four are already not their productivity tools. And I, I'll wait for your fifth one, but I am kind of curious if um, you run a tool that's like constantly taking screenshots because anytime I do offensive stuff or CTFs, I find that like I did something 10 minutes ago and I'm like, oh, geez, what was it? I remember it and all that. So uh, I don't know if that's one of your tools or not, but uh, I'd be curious and also finish the five. Not, yeah, not something that's taking a screenshot constantly, but like using uh, having your bash history or whatever your shell history that records the commands that you used in all the different tabs and like concatenates those. Um, sometimes we'll use, uh, there's a Unix command script that basically captures like the input and the output. So it records, you can replay what happens and you see like the screen moving as, as output scrolling. Um, the fifth tool, uh, shout out to Corey Overstreet on our team, says that he could do, largely do a 
uh, pen test with the Impacket framework. Um, okay. So the Impacket tools we use quite a bit, or at least variants of those. There's some things about them that need to be. Sometimes you need to tweak them because they're well signatured. Um, it's, a, but, it's, a, it's a GitHub repo. Uh, yeah. So let's see if I can find it here. Because uh, I've never heard of this. I don't know if anyone else has. And uh, you know, I'll be the first to admit I don't know everything. <laughs> but uh, this is great. If this is a tool that you're saying Corey said is a hands down home run, then everybody should know about this. So yeah, so the Fortra Impact It framework. So if you, when you go there and you look at, uh, like you can write your own tools using Impact It, but if you go to the examples, there's all these great tools in there. You can add a computer to the, to the domain. You can do curb roasting. You can do AS rep roasting. You can uh, write some of the ones that work great are like SMB exec or WMI exec when you want to get a command shell on a system. Um, however, those are heavily signature. They're the way they work and, and you need to modify them. Uh, so it's been some, take some time labbing it out to figure out how they work and, and what the artifacts that your tooling generates are. Um, but the impact framework is outstanding. All right. I've, I've gone ahead and dropped those in chat. So everybody gets those. Thank you, Nerman, for the question. And thank you, Mike, for that for sure. phenomenal answer. Um, just keeping the train rolling here. Um, here's, here's an interesting one. Do you only work with companies that have cyber insurance? Man, I don't even know about that. Um, like <laughs> talk to Joe and, and Tim about that. Um, I assume most people do, but I, I'm not, I thankfully don't have to deal with the contracting a whole lot anymore. So I don't know if we even look for that. Um, oh, okay. I should, I hope that most people do. Uh, a lot of our clients require us to have cyber insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and some of our clients require us to have like higher level, uh, you know, higher coverage cyber insurance. And so then we got to go shopping for that every once in a while. Um, but I don't know, like, do our clients have it or not? I, I honestly don't know. I I hope they do. Yeah, interesting. Uh, and yeah, this you know it's funny. Like like three questions just came up to my mind that I feel like would be appropriate to talk to you in person over beer and not so much on a live stream <laughs> around certain things. But uh, so Tony Parrish wants to know. This is a great one. How do you measure success? Like, what metrics are you using for your assessments? Is it like I got in or I didn't get in, or what? What do we? How do we measure? So that is uh, that is a great question with a lot of it depends and in, it's open to interpretation. I think having a test that has no findings is perfectly valid. Some people feel like, oh, we have to have findings. If we didn't pile on findings, it wasn't a good test. But the purpose of the test isn't to find findings. It's to validate, are your controls working the way they're supposed mm -hmm. to? Do you have good controls? And if you're doing really, really good things, then I may have to struggle and I may not find any findings. But what I've done is validate the controls that you put in place work. They did what they were supposed to do. And so what we have in our reports is a very extensive methodology section. Like, Here's all the different things that we did. These are the tools that we ran. This is the commands that we used to run them. Um, and then this is the output. And this is why we did that. Like we did, we started out doing port scanning. We found these ports and then we worked through all the open ports and what those services are and how do we test them. And we capture the output for all of those for whatever the, the type of test that we're doing. And we may not find anything, but we may not get any findings. We didn't win. The client won that that day, but we've got the uh, we've got our methodology that shows all the things that we did. So they didn't get a report that said, "Hey, you did good, no findings." And then, <laughs> well, what did you guys do for a week? Yeah, like, yeah. Exhibit A. Here's all the things that we did to show that you're you're doing a good job. Um, sometimes, you know, a good report has we're winning. And uh, we've got all of the findings uh, because that's good for us. That's good for our ego, right? Like as the testers. But uh, really, 
the how do we figure out if we're being successful or not is like the feedback from the client. And I think someone asked earlier, like how, you know, do we ever have people that aren't satisfied? Very like, rarely. Like CJ, CJ right here, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> On stage. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So very, uh, I would say very infrequently, um, because we work really, really hard to make sure that, um, levels are set expectations are are set you know before the engagement ever starts like we're clear what are we doing what mm -hmm. are we testing what techniques are we going to use what are we not going to do what is the goal that the client has all of those things so that when we start the assessment that we're trying to do the thing that they wanted you know, and as long as we're trying our best and we tried as much as we can to make sure that we were headed in the right direction, um, the client's usually satisfied with it. Um, and if they're not satisfied, uh, you know, then we work with them to try to resolve that. But that is, that's so infrequent. Yeah. Um, uh, because we were not like trying to crank out all the clients, like we're trying to do good work with good people. And, and when you're focused on doing good work with good people, then the chance that people aren't going to be satisfied is a lot lower, you know? Yeah. Well, if they were looking to be dissatisfied, they wouldn't have gone with Red Siege. Am I right, Mike? That's right. Exactly. That's right. So um, I, I love this one from Sean Riley. Um, so what are some key mistakes that you see companies making when contracting out for a red team, right? You've done a million contracts with different companies. I'm, I'm sure you've seen buckets of things happen. Is the scope too specific, too broad, not enough recon? You know, take us through what are some of these things that someone who's only done a thousand red team engagements would know? Yeah. So that's an interesting question because like when you read the details, it's coming at it from two sides, I think. Like one as someone who is pr wanting to purchase a red team, um, if you say, hey, I want a red team, and let's be specific, what does a red team mean? It's not a pen test. Like a red team is a goal-focused offensive security assessment where we're trying to get to a specific goal or set of goals within the environment. Sometimes we're trying to hit specific targets on the way. Like we want you to get in, but we want you to focus on phishing. But the more <clears throat> control, more restrictions you put on there, like, oh, you can only fish, but you can only fish these people. And oh, you can only fish at these times. Part of the thing with fishing is like, you have to get the right person with the right ruse on the right day. Like there's a lot of things that have to go right just to get the person to click on it. And then you have to have the right payload. I gotta know what EDR they have. I gotta have a bypass working. You know, if they say you can only fish well fishing's really hard these days like it, it like landing a good fish is really hard um it's still doable but it's hard but i can get jason the human cheat code to call someone up and convince them to go download something from a dropbox site and run it but like oh no no you can't social engineer our people you know you can only fish like so from the procuring side trying to put too many restrictions in place from the from the offensive practitioner side, uh, there's a lot of ways it can go wrong. Um, we throw up our infrastructure and we don't do it far enough in advance. So certain like web proxies will look to see and email security gateways net will look at be like, hey, how recently was this domain that they're using? How recently was it registered? Like if you just registered it two weeks ago, you might be burned. They might not let you speak to it at all already because you didn't buy it long enough ahead of time. Um, you get your C2 infrastructure set up and you fail to protect it against bots and scan scanning engines. And so we just did a, uh, we I just published a blog today on our Red Siege site about protecting your C2 infrastructure. You know, you can have your phishing site set up and someone like, uh, oh, I forget, what they're called right now, um, the scanning service, but they go out and they look at other people's websites and they're doing just kind of a survey of the internet. Netcraft is what it's called. 
So one time I failed to properly protect my phishing server. Netcraft saw that I had a Microsoft themed phishing page, basically a Microsoft login page, and then reported it to Microsoft. And so now my domain was burned. Like that got to start over, you know? So not protecting your infrastructure, um, sometimes trying to do things too fast, being too noisy, too fast. Like, you jump in like, yeah, I'm in, I got code execution, let me curb roast all the things. Like that's probably not a good idea. If you're gonna curb roast, do it targeted like one spin at a time. Sometimes it's the mistake of caution. You don't get all of the things that you should have because you're so worried about setting the alarms off. And so you get kind of like this paralysis because you're like, I'm so worried about getting caught that now I can't make up my mind to do anything. And at some point you just have to be like, we're going to go. And if we get burned, we get burned, but we got this far, you know? Um, yeah. And map dash E5. So <laughs> uh, yeah, it, like those are some of the mistakes. Um, a lot of it, like OPSEC, once you're running, like there's a lot of OPSEC mistakes that you can make with just like, fat fingering something, not understanding how your tools work ahead of time. Uh, one time I was on an assessment, it was towards the end of the assessment and I was running a new tool to do password spraying. The one that we were using, I think it was password spraying, but uh, no, it wasn't password spraying, it was share enumeration. Um, but the typical way that I enumerate shares wasn't working. Um, that tool was being blocked. I knew there was another tool out there that did it. I had taken a look at it, you know, looked at the source code, make sure it's good, it's legit, and I'm running it. However, uh, it was one of those programs where if you give it an argument that it doesn't understand, like given an option rather than saying like, Hey man, I don't know what you're trying to get me to do. Let me quit. And let's go back to the drawing board and you can get this right. Uh, instead it's like, Oh, you gave me a command. I don't understand. I'm just going to go to the default. So I was trying <laughs> to not get caught and I used the wrong flag to try to tell it like I want it single threaded. Let's only check one share at a time. Uh, and it defaulted to a hundred threads concurrently. So I went from operating silently, no one knew I was there to all of a sudden this one endpoint is enumerating every SMB endpoint in the company a hundred at a time, you know? And so like all of a sudden the, the blue team was just like, who are you? What are you doing on our network? And you were no longer allowed to be here, you know? So those kinds of mistakes, that's just one example of just, fat fingering something, not understanding something and getting caught, which the pain is real. The struggle is real. I don't know why, but in my mind, as you were reading that, or, or <clears throat> excuse me, saying that, I was just thinking of you being like Metal Gear Solid, like creeping around. And then, and then you run this command. And then, you know, that scene in the Disney Aladdin movie, the old one from like the nineties, when like he becomes Prince Ali and he makes the, he walks into Agrabah for the first team and the doors burst open and there's like elephant parading and all that. And it's like, it's like a full musical. That That's, that's what I heard. Like basically this, this thing was like the blue genie and just turns you into Prince Ali and you just kind of busted through the, the city gates there. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes there, I think it was a movie with like Catherine Zeta Jones where she's like, there's all these lasers and shit. Entrapment. Yes. Yeah. Like sometimes you're that person and you're getting through all the lasers and sometimes you're just busting down the door. Uh, whoops. Yeah. So. As, as Rich 464 so succinctly put it, stepping on a cat's tail. Yes. 100%. I love it. Oh, it's so good. Um, Dude, you're, you're just dropping knowledge bombs. People are definitely getting massive value. Uh, real quick, I, it wasn't really a question, but Jason Downey is in the chat and he actually pointed out that vishing is a, uh, a skill worth investing in learning because it'll pay dividends in the end. What do, what do you think? I mean, vishing is less, you know, I guess, hands-on keyboard, super elite technical, but it is a technique. It, it is definitely a technique. And I can tell you there are multiple occasions where I was on a red team. I wasn't getting anywhere. And finally, I was like, Jason, 
I need you to get someone to run this payload. Um, like maybe I'm filled with just like too much Midwestern guilt. Like I get nervous <laughs> when I'm about to submit a a phishing payload or you know phishing campaign. You know, like or if I'm about to pop a domain controller, like I know it's going to work. I know people are going to know I'm here now, but it doesn't matter at this point. But like I'm nervous. Like doing that in person or on the phone and like i'd be calling you trying to get you to give up your password be like, oh, oh, could, oh, could you uh, uh. and jason just rolls in he's like hey i'm jason i'm i need you to do this thing and i now no, i just need you to go ahead and run this payload you know like and uh, and and like they do it for him like he's just really really good he's very confident he says the right words and when he gets questioned he doesn't panic you know, like you might think like you're doing good until someone goes like, hey, what are you actually doing here? And they're like, ah, you know, and take off. Like he's very good at not doing that. And you have to be very good uh, uh, at doing that to be good at, at vishing. Like, and it's just a skill that I haven't developed, which is good that I have people like Jason on the team who can do that for me. Because sometimes that's the way you get in. Like sometimes calling people up on the phone works because you're not finding any exploits and none of the phishing stuff is landing. Yeah. It, it makes me think if you meet Jason Downey in person, he might uh, convince you to buy him a beer. Like one of those, like just, you know, like a, an illusionist or whatever, or a mentalist. He's like, you, you will buy me a beer kind of like Jedi mind tricks. I think so. I think so. <laughs> uh, Daniel Lowry. Uh, what's up, Daniel? Great to see you. Has a really uh, great question in chat. And I know I see the questions in chat about the junior level skills and fundamentals, and I'll ask Mike about that. But this one kind of caught me off guard. Uh, Mike, you are a principal consultant. You are a 25-year senior practitioner. You know what you're doing. But in our industry, you always have to be learning. You always have to be pushing yourself. What do you do to level up your skills? At, at a, like So seniors listening, right? Not seniors, but senior level people <laughs> listening, uh, well, well, you know, they could learn from you. Yeah. A, Daniel, thanks for the question. B, return my email, please. <laughs> Ooh, put I'm glad he's that. here. I'm glad he's here. Um, and C, there are still lots of things that, uh, that, you, that we can learn as senior people. I know how to write some code, but I can always need new techniques. Like the pool party thing we talked about earlier. Pool party is a new code execution technique. I need to know code code execution through pool party. Like I need to be able to write a shell code loader for that. I've got a tab open, one of my many tabs open in in uh, my browser on pool party, and I need to figure out how that works so I can implement it. Um, uh, I need to learn. So there's the code side of things. There's also we'll call like the soft skills, right? Like you know, always leveling up being able like phishing writing the emails like getting a really good looking phishing email so like look at your junk emails that you get and the ones that get past your junk filter and you'd be like well why did that get in if it got in through my filter it'll probably get in through other people's filter how can i base a ruse on that so that's one of the skills there um definitely uh it's people like there is a whole lot of people things to be developed like you know working on public speaking and i've been giving a lot of technical talks in the past but trying to give more not necessarily technical talks but more like i did a talk last year about called power up like building and enabling successful teams and and feeling so out of my element doing that. So working on those kinds of things, realize that there are people who can learn from things that are non-technical, non-hacking things, and that maybe I can bring something there. So I'm working on trying to develop that skill set, feeling comfortable giving that kind of information. I feel qualified to give you hacking information. I don't feel qualified to give you that. Be like, but you've been in the industry for a long time you've done these things you've been in management you know these things and be like and yet 
Yeah, it, that is that is interesting. You know, I mean, obviously our skill sets are totally different. But one thing that I struggle with, and I, I'm I'm kind of curious if you do, is like when I give talks to practitioners, right? So if I'm giving kind of general business talks and whatever, like no big deal, like fine. But when I'm talking to practitioners, um, I feel like, oh my god, like am I delivering value? Like these these people, like everything I'm saying, these people probably already know, right? Like like the people who are here in this talk are, you know, in line and aligned with what I'm into. So am I just telling them crap they already know? And am I like I, the imposter syndrome kind of creeps in for me when I'm giving more technical or more cyber focused talks to a cyber audience? Man, it. <sighs> There's a couple of things, like there, there, a couple of thoughts come to mind. One, like you feel like you need to give, you get to a certain level and you need to give like really high level, like super elite hacking talk. Uh, but one thing that, that John Strand told Tim Medina one time is like, at some point it's just wizards talking to wizards. And there's <laughs> two people in the room that understood what happened and everyone else was going like, I don't know what happened. It sounded cool, but I have no idea what that means. Like, and of the hundred people in the room, maybe one or two can actually act on that information, put it into, you know, put it into actuality and use it. Um, so, like there's always information to share um, that doesn't have to be super high. And someone may have said it before, but they haven't given your take on it. You've mm -hmm. got a perspective that's different based on your experience. So there's, even though a hundred other people have already written a blog on that, you haven't given your experience on that. Um, and like most people, most people are just wanting to learn like the rest of us. Like I know the things I know, but one of the best things about being really experienced is you realize what you know versus what you don't know. Right. Mm -hmm. Like the only thing about being experienced is you, you now have some perspective on like, I know so little, like yeah. when you're new, you're like, wow, I don't know anything. And they're very quick. Like I know all of the things and I'm now way at the bottom of the, like, I know nothing. Like there are so many things I don't know. And I'm just excited about learning and hearing what other people have to say. Yeah. I love that. Uh, that getting on the right side of the Dunning Kruger effect and a hundred percent there. And that's another thing I tell people all the time, especially people who are looking to get in the industry or, you know, start uh, breaking into cybersecurity. It's like, Listen, when you climb the hill and you get in, like there's another bigger hill directly in front of you. And when you climb that one, there's another hill in front of you. So uh, I hope you like climb. <laughs> um, so Mike, let me let me throw it to you because I'm talking about breaking in and expectations and stuff. I'm gonna I'm gonna show three different questions, but they're all essentially the same. And um, you know, people probably approach you all the time with this. How does someone get started with pen testing? If they like, how can someone get started in pen testing if they have some IT skills already? Tai Kwang Gong, good to see you, Tai. It's been a minute. How can I get into offsec? And how do you stay the course when things get rocky? So, kind of all similar questions. I'd love your take on that. So, how do you stay the course? Like getting in, like so. <sighs> First, how do you get into OPSEC? It's it's really um, it's really interesting um, because when I came up, like offensive security wasn't a thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like they didn't have schools you could go to. It was just like called system administration, and some people were better at it, and some people weren't. Um, but I still think that now, like I am good at what I do because I had so much experience doing all kinds of things like you said in the intro like i have been a developer i have been a mac repairman i have been you know windows support network support i ran an isp i did development at a shop for a while uh, i ran small companies i've ran unix networks like i've done a lot of different things and because i have all of this different experience i can see that what the commonalities are like there's not that many different things. And and once you know all these things, like, oh, I'm doing web application testing and this is a SQL server. I know how a SQL server works. I know how SQL queries work. 
makes it much easier to do SQL injection because you understand what's happening on the backside instead of just parroting out what someone puts in the uh, what someone puts on their web page. Hey, this is how you do SQL injection. And yes, uh, DJ VSEC, sys admins for the win, like 100%, 100%. Um, good sys admins are like, can be beast security people because really, really good sys admins are lazy. Like you <laughs> don't get to be a really good sys admin without being lazy. Like, because you're like, how can I be lazy? I want to do more things. So let's automate the boring crap. And good, good security people know how good sysadmins think. So when I get on a system, I think, how would I make this easier uh -huh. on myself? I'm going to go look for the thing that sysadmin might have done. Um, as far as like staying the course when it gets rocky, like, uh, man, just like look for, look for uh, opportunities to be useful where you're at. Um, if you're, if you're on the help desk, uh, help desk is the, is a great early warning system for security, like understanding, um, they get the calls from the users and all of a sudden a good help desk person can be like, Hey, I've had three users call about the same exact thing, call up the sock and be like, Hey, this is odd, but what do you think about this? Like, you know, you can, you can start to work your way in and be useful in other things um and just be persistent uh we talked about it earlier like oh there's another hill there's another hill there's another hill always be learning because it never stops like if you are not okay with constantly learning you're in the wrong field um whether it's offensive security defensive security um the grc side of things like i think based on my prior experience the grc might be a little bit slower on the learning curve just because there aren't new frameworks and management practices released every day but they get updated on a very regular basis and there's all the different frameworks that you have to know you've got you know which particular control framework are you mapping to and and those get updated and now we need to update our internal thing and so they're getting updated regularly and you need to keep learning and if you're not okay with learning new things all the time you're going to have a bad time in this in this industry yeah i mean I, I always try to be supportive and inclusive so i never say it's not for you but i do tell people like these are some axiomatic realities about being in the industry and if that doesn't jive with you it, it's not going to change <laughs> so you know that is what it is we're getting close yeah 100 percent we're getting close on time, surprisingly. I can't believe that hour flew by, but I, I, I do want to ask these two quick questions here. Um, so if, if you can answer them, please, Mike, but um, you know, just... So Leonardo, uh, who's wearing the Red Siege merch right now, wants to know if you use ADCS often in red team engagement or is it too noisy? And if you can qualify what ADCS is for two thumbs and smiling and doesn't understand what that is. Sure. Active Directory Certificate Services is what okay, ADCS cool. stands for. So... It's how certificates are issued for trust in an Active Directory network. They don't have to be there, but uh, when they're there, they can be misconfigured in a way that will allow users who don't have privileges to request a ticket on someone else's behalf. So if you, Gerald, are the domain admin and I, Mike, am just a user and your ADCS is misconfigured, I could request a ticket on behalf of Gerald that's given to me and now I can impersonate Gerald yeah. like uh, that's the easiest level one there is some noise to it depending on the escalation vector um and and so uh the ADCS research was released by the folks over at Spectre Ops and uh uh I forget uh someone can probably drop it in here I forget what the link is certified pre-owned is the name of their white paper and uh, lots of different escalation what's vectors. The, uh, what's the group's name? I'll pull it up. Spectre, Spectre Ops. So. Okay, okay, okay. I got you. I got it. Right here. Got it. Okay. So. I'm quick. Uh, yeah. Yep. There you go. So those are I'll drop some that amazing. If you read that white paper and read the tools that they have out, uh, we still do ADCS stuff. Like there are certain things that are more, more noisy than other others. Um, but usually 
like something might be noisy and it might have IOCs, but it depends on someone watching. Um, and even things might get logged, they might get alerted on, but you know, the blue team might be having a bad day. Like one time we did something that we absolutely should have gotten caught on, but the blue team was dealing with an actual attack like actual attack happening, real bad actors trying to get into their network. And so they didn't pay attention to us. They didn't know we were in the network, but they didn't see us because they were dealing with an actual fire. Thank you, Daniel. I'm sorry that I put you on blast there. I think that <laughs> I must have looked like a fish because I sent it and he didn't get it. And that has happened more than That's once. That's funny. So. Well, the nice thing is you can write this uh, this hour off to Red Siege for business development, and you're you're doing emails with Daniel Lowry. So I mean, this is you're right. working right now. That's right. You said there was a second question. Yeah. So this one's a little bit more uh, on the business side. But Becky Gaylord says, "What's the rough percentage on client projects like proactive risk management versus post incident assessment and analysis?" Thanks for the question, Becky. Um, boy. I like, I don't even know that that applies for me um, because we don't do like, you know, risk management and post incident assessment. Like we don't deal with that at all. I don't know how much the clients have. We, we don't have visibility into that most of the time, uh, how much is being spent there. Um, but like back in my days as a pr practitioner, like, for every hour of a pen test, there is probably 10 hours of risk management work ahead of time. And, uh, and maybe not 400 hours, that's a lot, but maybe three hours for every hour that it, so if a pen test was gonna be one week, 40 hours, there was probably three works of work ahead of time, making sure that things are where they're supposed to be, knowing where the bodies are so that like, they're gonna uncover this, but we need to know about it. And then afterwards, like, analyzing the output, figuring out what's the true impact and risk, and then how do we mitigate that? Uh, there is definitely one to three, one to four. Wow. All right. Well, dude, like what an amazing episode. Uh, people are asking you to come back for episode two because like literally we didn't even scratch the surface of all the different topics people wanted to talk about. Uh, yeah. 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 So like, Mike, thank you so much for, for coming, for sharing your thoughts. Shout out to the entire Red Siege squad. You guys roll deep at cons. You roll deep on uh, podcast, I guess. I mean, I, 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 I like cringe to call this a webinar. Uh, we were talking about that before the show. This is definitely not your dad's uh, webinar. <laughs> um, and shout out to the Simply Cyber community. A couple of people we haven't seen in a while showing up. So it's great as always. Uh, Mike, before we uh, end the show, is there any like, you know, projects coming up you want people to know about or, you know, socials people that you want them to connect with, like uh, share with yeah. us what you're excited about? So there's, there's a few things that we got going on. One, thank you to everyone that came here. Uh, like, I'm not kidding you. If you were here at the beginning, I was dealing with some serious imposter syndrome today. Like stuff was not working. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, so it's really good to be here. Um, like, have that self-doubt this was perfect like what i needed to see that like yeah we're all in this together we're working yes. so thank you um things that we have coming up there's gonna be uh there's gonna be a, a blog coming out soon we didn't even talk about the c2 a whole lot but alex reed who's interning is part of the skills bridge program with us has a uh blog coming out on using Az the azure graph api for c2 with cobalt strike it's mind blown yeah yeah man he, he's doing some crazy stuff so that blog is going to be coming out we have a number of blogs that we're going to be publishing really soon here um on some is, different things is that, that on the red process. siege blog is that what you're referring to yep on the all red right siege so I'm, blog. I'm gonna pull this up for some reason i cannot drop clickable hyperlinks in chat but i am dropping these in chat so everybody on youtube just go ahead and copy paste that but that is the blog that uh, Mike is talking about. This is his blog post that he referenced earlier in the show. Um, I'm sure there's some way to like subscribe to this or push it into an RSS feed so you can be made aware when that um, Azure uh, Graph C2 is, um, is, is posted. Yeah, so a couple other things. Um, uh, I see that Joshua uh, said like, is there a chance to get Red Siege folks on a weekly basis? 
Um, we've got the uh, Wednesday offensive that, uh, and actually Joshua just posted it, like the Wednesday offensive happens every Wednesday, 30 minutes, no slides, no BS, coming in and get some great knowledge from a lot of different people from both offensive and defensive side. We've got our Discord, redsiege.com slash Discord, uh, where uh, I think it's much like this. It's a supportive community. Um, if you come in and try to be like, you're an idiot, you don't know what you're talking <laughs> about, people are going to be like, you know what? Why don't you just not come back? We yeah. don't need that around here. So uh, I think we got a great community. You've got a great community here. Like I, I second and third, I, I would come back. Like this has been great. Cool. So many things we could talk about. And uh, man, I love seeing some familiar faces and lots of new ones here. So and, uh, and we've booked Jason Downey. Like while we've been talking, I've sweet. I've also been uh, producing over here, and Jason Downey's going to come on. We'll call it the Vishing episode. Yeah, and if you're on, you can send me a connection request on LinkedIn. If you're on Twitter or whatever you want to call it, I'm Hardwater Hacker. Uh, we've got uh, the Red Siege Twitter account at, at Red Siege and our LinkedIn accounts. Like you'll see stuff going on there. Um, All right. And uh, what is it, Hardwater Hacker, Mike? Hard water. Hard so. water. What's the background on that? So. You know how you uh oh there we have my oh. banner right there at the top. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. It's sorry, Kennedy. That's a, that's another thing. So if if we cuss on the show, there's like a swear jar emote. Uh, <laughs> and nice. we apologize. Kennedy is the avatar for the under eighteen population because uh, we we do have children who uh sure uh, the shows. yeah. So you know how you said you moved because you hated the cold. Yes. So. I am built for the cold. So up here we have two seasons. We have soft water season and hard water season. The difference is like you can walk on water in the hard water season because it freezes. And I love to go ice fishing and social engineer fishes. I fish fishes and, uh, <laughs> and nice. I love to be outside. So that's where I came from. Like I needed something, uh, signing up for sans net wars like 12 years ago, I needed a handle and I was like hard water hacker and and I just got lazy and that's what it's been since then. No, it's great. It's perfect. It's it's you, right? I mean, that's that's kind of like you can't always be professional all the time, right? You do have to have some personality. Um yep. even, yeah. I mean, even my morning brief, at the end of the brief, I like flip a script and I put on glasses and I become Jerry Guy uh, instead of Dr. <laughs> Gerald Dozier. So <laughs> it's all about guy. good times, man. All right, guys. Hey, uh, genuinely appreciate you going over. Thank you to all of you in chat. We've been talking with Mike Saunders from Red Siege. Go check out all the links that were dropped in chat for the blog, the Wednesday Offensive, which I have attended multiple times and have loved. Uh, we've got more Red Siege um, uh, staff coming on the stream. I, I was just messaging with Molly. We're going to line more of the staff up. Uh, go check out Mike on LinkedIn and Twitter at Hardwater Hacker. Mike, thanks so much. And thank you, everybody. Uh, it's been a great show. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time. Everybody, I hope you enjoyed that content. Keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. I hope you enjoyed the content and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you.